Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. This is a good day to be inside talking about gardening, right? Or maybe plotting and planning. What kind of garden you'd like to have? Well, the weather, you know, we're here we are in summer and it's it's already a doozy of one. And I know that's difficult for, for folks to get really excited about gardening at this time, but there is a lot uh, that we can be planting. Uh, harvesting, taking care of, preparing, all kinds of stuff like that right now. You know, in our vegetable gardens, we have heat-loving vegetables. We have flowers that do really well in the heat. Most of the time, though, remember when a plant uh, is promoted, maybe accurately, let's say, as, as being drought tolerant or heat tolerant, that is a plant that is established. And so when you take the plant out of its container, uh, all the roots are wound up in that container, and that plant is not drought tolerant. It needs to be watered regularly right in that original cylinder, or maybe it's, you know, a vegetable or a flower that's heat tolerant. you got to keep it watered for a while. Once those plants have extensive root systems, then they're tough. Then they can take any kind of thing, uh, some of them, and do well, even through the heat and the summer. But uh, just don't assume. Uh, the analogy I use is uh, uh, what? Um, oh gosh, I just lost the <laughs> lost the thought train of thought that I was talking about. Anyway, oh John Wayne, John Wayne, John Wayne's one old tough hombre, right? But when he was a baby, there was somebody that was nursing him and changing his diaper and helping him get along, and if you will, get established. And so think of your plants that way. I mean, they may be the tough species, but uh, you got to get them established, then their toughness can show through. Just some kind of early thoughts. Hey, uh, let me give you a phone number and an email. This is a call-in show, and we invite you to call in. Our phone number, 979-845-5689. 979-845-5689. And if you want to reach me by email, it's gardensuccess at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu i'm going to go to the emails in a little bit here uh, but first i want to um, just i should be saying this all the time uh, but uh, i come into the show to do the show and and do the emails and the phone calls and things like that and right after the show i have to leave for another uh, you know another uh, appointment that, that i have to get to but uh, as a result, I, I don't have the ability to type out a lot of answers to emails. So just assume that uh, if you email me, I'm looking at it and I'll talk about it on the air. And that way we can make sure, you know, that nobody's going, well, he never emailed me back. Well, I, I'm just not able to uh, do that. But I will talk about it on air. And if for some reason uh, you missed it, feel free to email me again and say, hey, you may have talked about this, but I didn't hear it. Um, and be happy to, to go back into it with you. Uh, we're going to go to the phones now. Again, the number 979-845-5689. We're going to talk to Kathleen. Hello, Kathleen. Hello. Um, thanks for taking my call. I'm calling today because a nice flower that grows that's called Ruelia Britonicia. Brit Brit Britoniana. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um Mexican pansy. It grows really well, and I've always liked it, but it's in a section of the yard where mosquitoes are deciding that's where they can have a nice place even though the drought. So uh, having pulled some of them out, decided to put on some Roundup to try to kill them. And they're still coming back, and I'm wondering if Maybe there's something better than a 2% glyphosate, or if I should just do another application because they're nice and tough. Okay, so are you wanting to get rid of all of the Mexican petunias? All of them in this corner of the yard, yeah. They proliferate um, okay. mosquitoes. 
Yeah, they have underground um, chutes that that go subsurface. So even yeah. if you cut everything off above, they're popping up everywhere, as you've noticed. Uh, the, those would be, I guess, uh, rhizomes that are going underneath the ground. Anyway, I've never tried to spray kill it before. You could try taking the glyphosate up to a 10%. Be real careful. Uh, yeah. Don't pump the pump sprayer up too much. Definitely don't use a hose-in sprayer. Don't pump the pump sprayer up too much so that it would, when high pressure creates kind of a mist that drifts, uh, yeah. Keep it low pressure, coarse droplets, and, you know, go after it. Uh, if the plant is in somewhat of a healthy state of growth, it'll it'll work better. Roundup works better or glyphosate works better, whichever version of glyphosate you buy. Uh, it works better when plants are actively growing. Uh, so yeah. that, that, would, that would be one thing. If you try that and it doesn't work, you you could also then we could switch over to a broadleaf uh, broadleaf weed control product and there's a number of options out there. Uh, okay, uh, I have just, a a brush killer. Yeah. And that has a chemical called tri triclopyr. Yes. Yes, that that could be tried. Again, I've not used triclopyr on this. It is it works well on broadleafs uh, and brush, of course. Um, you don't want to over apply either the glyphosate or the triclopyr and then like have a rain or something wash it down into the the root system if you have any shoots let's say you're applying it around a tree and it's just tree trunk that's fine but if it has a sucker shoot coming out of the bottom you want to get rid of those before you spray uh, so mm -hmm. just take all those things in mind uh, follow the label very carefully I would try the glyphosate since you already have it, or you could switch over to the triclopyr. I've just never tried to kill that before with yeah. the triclopyr, so I hate to send you out to do something if I'm not certain of what I'm talking about. Okay, well, the glyphosate I have right now is the 2% Roundup. You mentioned up to 10%. Would yeah. I find that at Lowe's Garden you, Center? Uh, I don't know. That okay. I, That I'm not sure about. Uh, when you get into the stronger kinds of things, you're probably going to find those at a place like Producers Co-op, for example, Producers here locally. Producers Co-op. Yeah, they, they carry a wide variety. And the, the full strength Roundup is about a 48% glyphosate. Uh, you don't need that. I think they make a 10 or 20% that may be in a little quart bottle. But you you just dilute it more when you buy a stronger one. So it's With water. Yeah, there's no problem. You, it doesn't have to be too strong. You dilute it, but if you want something a little stronger, uh, then you could, you know, you could go for that. Um, right. Also, uh, I'm I'm comfortable with wearing rubber gloves and a mask and just pouring the stuff on. If maybe that's a better way to go compared to the spray. No, I wouldn't, because that's applying way too much. You only need to put enough out to wet the foliage. If the foliage is dripping on the ground move on you've you've overwet the foliage uh it, dampened foliage is what works okay. anything beyond that is wasted and could potentially be leading to other issues very good advice thank you so much skip all right good luck with that that is a <laughs> that is a wonderful uh, yet enthusiastic weed and uh, it i mean flower <laughs> but that becomes a weed uh, yeah but, they're real good looking green and purple oh, and they are. hardy yeah, and the bumblebees will get in one of those flowers and just be banging around in there like they're wrestling on a pillowcase or something. It's a, it is it is really funny to watch them in in one of those uh, Ruelia flowers. <laughs> well, I've always enjoyed them, but this batch we got to get rid of. So thank you for your help. All right, you take care. Thanks for the call, Kathleen. You also, thank you. Our phone number is 979 and you can also email me at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. I'm going to answer a question uh, from Shelby, but actually uh, it's a question that about everybody and their dog has right now, and that's why are my trees dying? Uh, and to be honest, it is the one question that uh, I most don't look forward to answering. <laughs> and the reason is, 
because it's not a simple answer. You know, why is your tomato rotting on the bottom? That's blossom end rot. Here's what you do, and you can fix it. Uh, but with trees, they are, you know, they're the giants of our landscape. Their, their root systems are extensive, you know, many times going two and a half times the height of the tree out in all directions. And so that, that makes them resilient. But at the same time, there are things that can stress a tree. And as you stress any living thing, you open the door to issues that otherwise it might have been uh, able, you know, to overcome. So, for example, uh, using, I was just talking about using herbicides and don't overply them and drench them in the soil. You can, there are some herbicides labeled for uh, turf weeds and very safe for turf. But when they get drenched in, you will see significant damage to trees and shrubs in the area because trees and shrubs have their roots all through your yard. Your yard is filled with trees. In fact, your neighbor and maybe the neighbor down the street, next neighbor, two neighbors down, uh, has got some of your tree roots in their yard uh, in, in many cases. Uh, so it's, it's easy to cause damage with those kinds of products when they're misused. Drought is extremely stressful to trees and it weakens them. Now you may look at the tree and it looks just fine, but just know that it, it is in a less uh, than fully uh, strong state. And so that's an issue. Coal damage can affect trees. In February 21, we had uh, seven degrees, at least at my place. I don't know how cold it was at yours, but that's cold enough and uh, we, we saw damage. Uh, and then last December, we had a freeze, December 22, where the freeze hit, and it was a hard freeze. It was down the, I believe, mid-teens, if I'm not mistaken, almost almost to there. Uh, it, it, it just caught plants off guard. They hadn't hardened off. They hadn't gone through the normal process of slowing down, storing up their sugars, and getting ready for winter. And the, the plant that is showing that the most right now is crepe myrtles. You see crepe myrtles all over town with dead branches, sometimes dead all the way to the bottom, and then the roots are suckering up, coming back. But that top growth was, was killed by that. So we're talking about drought, we're talking about cold. Uh, then we have other issues, the chemicals that sometimes we can apply to cause problems. And some species of trees just don't like being part of a landscape. And post oak is the poster child of all those kind of trees. Uh, post oaks don't like to be in a landscape. Now I know you probably have a giant 300 year old post oak in your front yard, maybe, and it's surviving. But just know this, that uh, of all the trees, when it comes to something that's going to turn brown pretty fast and head down south, uh, that would be the species that we most see that happening to. They don't like it when we come in and disturb the soil, trenching for water lines and gas lines or whatever else. Uh, they don't like the compaction of vehicle traffic over the soil. They don't like you to spread a bunch of grass and start watering it enough to keep grass happy, they're not happy with that. They're native to the post oak belt, gravelly soil that goes down from, oh, I don't know, around Cuero all the way up uh, through our area and further north. Uh, but the things we do to make our plants happy do not make post oaks happy. And so that's one of the issues that we see with them. Uh, you know, a tree that's planted too deep. Uh, there are just a lot of things that can stress a plant. So when they get stressed, then problems start to come in. And then you begin to see the long-term decline of a tree. Sometimes that happens fast, sometimes not. But when it's 100 degrees day after day after day and we're not getting rain, uh, that tree is working hard to pull enough water from the soil and take it all the way back to the trunk and up the trunk and out to the leaves. And it probably can't pump the water fast enough in cases where water is somewhat limited. Uh, and if it was fall or spring, that tree would be just fine because it's not having to pump so much water, uh, not only to maintain its, its uh, biological processes, but also just to cool it, just to keep it cool. You know, leaf tissues cannot be 130 degrees. I mean, they're, they're going to die long before that. Uh, and yet, when you look at the sun baking down on something on a summer day like this, it, it gets really hot. So they're pumping a lot of water. It's their evaporative cooling system, I guess, if you will, uh, to, to help stay alive. So when that water is in short supply, which in many cases it is now, when the root system is limited by things we do, 
uh, then that is just all the more stress for the tree. So that was a long answer. Do you see why I don't like to answer tree questions? I'm not done yet. So, <laughs> so uh, we start to see secondary things happen. Like if you see splits on the trunk, that could be a stress crack from uh, movement, drought, things like that. It could be a freeze crack from cold that we had. And so after the freeze crack happens, it's not like, you know, the tree just splits open in, in many cases. Uh, it's like now you have damage and now you have the opportunity for organisms to move in there uh, and you start to see some different problems happening. So now you have a tree that is already struggling to get the limited amount of water up to the leaves. And so now on top of it all, what we're doing is we're we're messing with all the little tubes, all the highway system that goes from the tips of the roots out to the ends of the leaves. Uh, we're, we're sort of putting roadblocks up uh, as it tries to keep up. So now we're making it even more difficult. Well, I'm going to give you a chance to catch your breath while I go to a phone call and me to catch my breath. <laughs> and we'll continue this tree talk in just a minute because it is the number one question. Uh, we're going to go to the phones, and uh, by the way, the number 979-845-5689, and we're going to talk to John. Hello, John. Good morning. Uh, I have a spaghetti squash question. Okay. The squirrels were kind enough to leave us a couple on the vine. Okay. And uh, the vines are just starting to brown out, and Mary wants to know when, I mean, it, is there some sign that you know the spaghetti squash is ready to cut off the vine, or is it you yeah. wait it off, or what? That's that's a tough one. Uh, you know, you put your thumbnail into something like a spaghetti squash or a pumpkin, uh, and when it's young, it just is like sticking your nail through the zucchini or a yellow squash. Uh, and as it gets old, that gets leathery and tough. And so you can kind of test that way. Uh, I would I would just you know if you have to bring them in if the vines you know, going downhill and dying, then just bring them in and, and store them and see how they do for you. Uh, they often will spaghetti squash. They have the beautiful yellow color. It, it sort of changes a little bit as they reach their full maturity. And kind of looking at the color uh, can be helpful. Uh, but I think if they've kind of reached what you would consider the normal size for that variety, if you've grown it before, uh, or for a spaghetti squash, then uh, you probably can go ahead and, and pick it, and it would be okay. I've never tried to pick them immature. Okay. Well, we'll uh, take a hard look at it. I, I just It just doesn't look like the vine's doing it any good anymore. So. Yeah, well, that you know that happens to our winter squashes, and which includes pumpkins. Uh, it, it We have powdery mildew. We have foliage diseases. We have spider mites. And then, of course, there's a squash vine borer for some of those species. And uh, it... It's difficult to make it all the way. That's why we don't have a big pumpkin industry here in the Brazos Valley. It's a, it's a, it's a hard thing to make it that far along. Uh, the heat, the heat is not helping it either. It does not, does it? No, nope, yeah. not one bit. That is for sure. Uh, but those are great squash to grow, and uh, hopefully you've got something that you can enjoy. Yeah, I, I think we'll, we'll, uh, maybe we'll take one and. Leave the other one or something. Hey, we'll figure something out. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. All right. Thank you for the call. Bye. Our phone number, 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. I'm going to go back to the tree now. Yeah, we're not done. So the when the tree starts to struggle, you see things like, and by the way, for a post oak, struggling could mean you are watering the yard way too much. I know it's hot and it needs water, but you're overdoing it. Or it could mean uh, the, the soil's not moist enough for the tree. Uh, and so think of watering, you think of watering your lawn as a weekly activity and flower beds and vegetables and whatnot and once or twice a week. But when it comes to trees, we just move in for rescue waterings. We don't we don't have our our yard shade trees on a watering schedule. Uh, so one, if it hasn't rained 100 degrees, hadn't rained for two weeks or, or so, even a little longer, I mean you can give a good deep soaking to as large of an area as you can. Uh, more of a soaking than you would just for your grass. Uh, and then you're just sort of rescuing that tree and giving it a bank account to, to have it draw from going forward. So too wet, too dry. You'll start to see a loss of the uh, green color. 
the leaves start moving towards chartreuse color uh, uh, and uh, uh, even almost yellow uh, sometimes. You'll see the tips and the margins on the sides of the leaf start to burn before the center does in many cases. Uh, that's a sign on any kind of plant. I saw some roses this morning that had that problem and and so uh, t that tip and margin burn you'll see crepe myrtles in parking lots is where I see it a lot just it, it, all the tips and margins are burned and it just needs water. It just needs water. So uh, making sure that is. Now let me give you another complicating factor. There are diseases uh, that can move in and create additional problems. One disease is, uh, the name of the disease is called xylella, like xylophone. And the xylella is a disease that's found all over our state. You find it in a lot of weeds and other things, and it's the main reason why we don't have a bigger uh, vinifera wine grape industry here than we do. Uh, especially as you get down to the south and east part of Texas, we're limited in the grapes we can grow because xylella will wipe out the entire vineyard. I mean, it, it, is a, it plugs the plumbing of the plant. So these bacteria move into the plumbing, all those little tubes I was talking about, and they proliferate. And they basically make this big, um, you know, roadblock of bacterial goo that just prevents a flow through the through the the tubes and and supplying the leaf. So it's the same thing as cutting the roots off. I mean, you, you can't get water through. And xylella affects uh, oleanders uh, a lot. Uh, we see that on on oleanders. You will find xylella on red buds and and like I said, weeds. Uh, uh, Dr. Black, a pathologist out at Uvalde with AgriLife Extension, uh, did a study of all kinds of plants out in that area, uh, bringing them into the lab testing for xylella and just making a list of all the different things because if you're having a vineyard you probably don't want those kind of weeds around uh, but anyway xylella can uh, plug the plumbing and cause some of these symptoms too and if a plant is healthy and all things are doing well uh, you know it can get by because a lot of our plants aren't as susceptible to xylella as grapes would be in terms of, of being a threat to the life of the plant so anyway, uh, you'll see something like this in sycamores, where sections of the leaf just turn brown. Uh, you let's see, there's just a lot of different plants that can have the xylella. But here we go. We've got a tree. We talked about all the things the tree needs and all the things that prevent it getting that, and then all these things that move in. And you know, where a tree was marginal, it's getting by. Uh, and then you just reduce the water a little bit with some of these things, and now it's not getting by, and it starts dying. And so the reason these are frustrating questions is because there's not a magic bullet. You know, it'd be nice if I could just say, go, spray it. go spray it with something and it would be fine. But in fact, um, about all you can do is give it a good soaking. It's kind of like, you know, you remember the, it's almost cliche, but you go to the doctor and you got a cold, which is a virus, and he says, get plenty of rest and drink lots of fluids. In other words, I don't have a medicine for that virus, although as time goes on, we, we are starting to see some other meds, but you get the idea. So for your tree like that, get plenty of rest, drink lots of fluids. Don't Anything you can alleviate as a stress, alleviate it. And make sure the soil is moist. It doesn't need to be soggy wet. In fact, you can kill plants faster in the summer by overwatering than just about anything. And so a good moist soil to draw from and avoid adding insult to injury. Watch out when you put a herbicide down in the lawn. Uh, d d if you're having traffic, somebody's driving across the tree's root system to park the car, reroute that uh, because that, or come up with some other system because that, that is very, very hard on the trees. So that's a long answer to, uh, oh, there's one other thing. Um, I uh, In the... In the photos that I was looking at uh, for the, the pictures on this tree, there there were leaky spots on the trunk. So you've got what appears to be like a crack or a sore or something on the trunk, and moisture is leaking out of that and going down. And uh, oftentimes you find insects gathering there. Butterflies will gather there, uh, and wasps will gather there, uh, the two of the prime insects you see there. What's happened is maybe a stress crack allowed bacteria to get under the bark. 
and now they're proliferating. But in that spot, there's nowhere for air to escape. And so they literally lift the bark up off of the wood underneath it. That pressure does that. And you get this leaking, but as it's uh, as it's uh, sitting there, it's a sugary substance. It's coming from sap, and so it starts to ferment. And sometimes uh, we call this slime flux, and there's, there's a bacterial wet wood, and there's slime flux. There's different terms for different kinds of things that are in this group. But sometimes it's frothy and white because it's, it's bubbles bubbling out of there. And so basically what you've got is a little mini uh, butterfly and uh, wasp beer joint, and they love to hang out there and get that fermented uh, fluids. Now, a healthy tree can just wall that off, and it's not anything to worry about. If a tree is, is very old, so its vigor is maybe a little less, uh, you may see those spots with slime flux or whatever version of it it is just continuing to leak. Uh, we see it a lot in the summertime, not so much other times of the year. Uh, but if if you um, you know if you can just get the tree healthy, then that is the best way for it to deal with it. You don't spray anything. There's nothing to spray on your tree where it's leaking like that to kill that inside. Because I guess I'd have to ask a pathologist if technically you would call that a a, a disease, slime flux, the, that kind of thing. It's it's bacteria. It's in the tree. It's not doing the tree any good, but it's not like they're attacking the tree itself. Uh, it's just their their fermentation process uh, that is, you know, kind of creating the problem. Well, that's almost half the show, and we've been talking about trees, but you're not calling. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, our phone number, 845-5689. Give us a call if you have any gardening questions. Uh, spare your fellow listeners uh, having to listen to me drone on any more about trees, and we'll get into that. Or you can go to garden success at tamu.edu, garden success at tamu dot edu and we'll be able to um, you know visit about maybe if you've got some good photos that would be real helpful um, that we could I, it's always easier to diagnose with photos and uh, tree problems are certainly that way but any kind of an issue that you might have would be easier to diagnose with a with a good quality photo or maybe it's something that we are trying to identify so let's go to the emails right now. Uh, Raymond, you had sent me some pictures. We had a, pictures of a, a leaf that I couldn't identify, and then you sent some more pictures. Got a little bit of a bloom on it, and what you have is called pokeweed. Uh, if you are from the South, you probably know about pokeweed. If you are from Southern culture, you probably have eaten pokeweed. Pokeweed is a very tall weed that has big leaves on it. It has little stalks of white flowers that are followed by fruit that start off kind of a magenta red or something and they they end up with purple they look like little purple berries all up and down that that spike that once held a lot of white flowers pokeweed is poisonous you shouldn't eat it but pokeweed is a common vegetable of the south and here's what they do they boil the leaves and they pour off the water maybe boil it a second time with some more water and pour off that water and it gets all the bad stuff out of there and you can eat pokeweed, or as they call it, poke salad. Now, I don't know how they discovered that. I have theories, uh, but how do you find out that a plant that's poisonous, well, you could eat it if you boiled it and poured off the water twice. My theory is that uh, somebody, you know what, uh, somebody was, was um, uh, you know, trying to poison somebody and they slipped and spilled the pot and the water ran out and so they had put new water in it and boiled it again and then it, it didn't poison them or something. I don't know. That is a, a bizarre, macabre story as well. But anyway, poke salad, pokeweed, that's what it is. Uh, berry, birds plant it for you, by the way. Birds do a lot of planting for us uh, and it's usually things we don't want them to plant. The hackberries in your fence line, the poison ivy in your fence line and underneath trees, uh, the pokeweed that you see, the mistletoe that's in your tree. All of those are seeds that go through a bird's digestive system, and with one little flick of the tail, that seed gets planted and fertilized in one, one movement, and here it comes. And so uh, we, we can, oh, another one, uh, mulberries. Yeah, birds a lot are planting mulberries for everybody everywhere. 
So anyway, that's they're the little gardeners of the, let's say, woody weeds of the world. It's a good term for them, woody weeds. Going back to the email, I uh, had a question from JC about um, there's a tree that he has growing. It's got a nice mulched area around it. But the soil is so heavy. It's a heavy clay, and he's concerned about root penetration in that soil and was questioning about maybe adding mesquites, a few around that area, that because they have a taproot that can puncture through the the soil. Um, and then taking them out, I guess, at some point. I, I don't think that would be a good strategy. Uh, I would say look at things you can do to help improve your soil. Certainly in a lawn, aeration is good. I've known people that did a more deeper aeration using a something like a broad fork where you sit on it and kind of crack the soil open. And then you follow that with a top dressing of compost, screened compost, not big chunky stuff, but very fine compost all over the area, and it falls down in those holes. And it opens them up, and it brings oxygen in, and it improves the root system. And so I think you can do that. Now, at some point, uh, there are trees that aren't going to put up with a heavy clay soil, especially a high pH one. They're just not geared for that. And so those would be species you wouldn't want to plant. That's one of the reasons we often look to native plants, because they've grown here, and they can, they can tolerate it. So I think I would try a different uh, technique there. Uh, I think, number one, finding mesquites that are tap-rooted uh, is going to be a little difficult. A lot of times we, um, you know, we have a tree that the species would be tap-rooted, but if, if the root was damaged, which often happens in a container, uh, then it's got all kinds of roots going all over the place and not, not so much. Uh, let's see, we're going to head back to the emails again. Uh, and uh, Suzanne, I think I may have answered this one last week, but does, does squash borer attack uh, butternuts and pumpkins? And I think I, I indicated that anything that has a big hollow stem, the squash vine borer is going to really do a lot with that. Um, if it, the uh, butternut squash has a, a smaller, denser stem, and I'm told that it, it's not as prone to squash vine borer. But I would be really careful and not overstate that because, like I said, uh, they will attack other things other than just squashes. Uh, and so they prefer the squash, and they'd rather rather be on that. Uh, but, yeah, the butternut probably be a good choice. I saw something on, on the web the other day, which is usually the prelude to saying something that amounts to baloney. Uh, but I saw something on the web, and this guy was, was pruning up his squash, and he'd staked the squash, and he's removing all the lower limbs. So it had a little trunk on it, you know, like two feet high. And and, and he was saying he didn't get vine borer. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I mean, I believe he's not lying. He didn't get it on his plants. But uh, I had a, a type of a squash, a trombocino squash, that was growing on a fence. And I noticed up in the air, three feet off the ground, vine borer holes with the little sawdust coming out in that squash. And so I don't see why having a trunk to your squash would keep them from getting into the stem. They can, they have a lot of ways to go about that, but something to think about. Uh, as far as things to plant now, I've had a number of questions about, can I plant this now? Can I plant that now? Uh, we're, we're in the big middle of July. And so this is the time when our number one crops are going to be uh, things like okra and black-eyed peas and purple hull peas, all the southern peas like that. Uh, the hot season greens like Malabar, amaranth, and others uh, would be right now. Of course, your sweet potatoes are growing now. It's getting a little late to plant them, but uh, they're, they're growing now. Uh, the... Fall season is coming, and so we can plant things that we don't expect harvest from until the weather cools off a little bit. And that would be things like uh, peppers, maybe, or eggplant. And you may get lucky, you may get a little bit of harvest. Uh, if you're going to have a fall tomato crop, fall tomatoes are not a great thing. They just don't produce as well because of the way the seasons and temperatures change going into fall rather than coming out of spring. But uh, now's the time to plant your fall tomatoes if you're going to do that. And then we have some warm season crops that we can plant for the fall season. And one of them uh, would be things like cucumbers. 
uh, you can start planting uh, cucumbers sometime. And I, I would wait until later July, maybe even early August. Cucumbers take about somewhere between, what, 48 and, I don't know, 55 days or so uh, to reach harvest. And you would like that to happen uh, about the end of September, early October, when things are cooling off a little bit. So you, your October is, is when you're picking. But once it cools off a lot, then those warm season crops are just crawling along. They're not moving very fast. So that's the challenge going uh, into the fall. Uh, another uh, option would you know, be peppers. Uh, the peppers do, do well in the fall. And by the way, if you have pepper plants, I hope you keep them and don't pull them out because your fall crop will be better than your spring crop was because you have big plants and those plants you can hang a lot of peppers on. Think of peppers as ornaments. How big is the pepper plant? That's how many ornaments you can hang on it. Okay, so that that would be another thing. Uh, when we get into August, we'll start talking about some other faster crops uh, like uh, bush beans, uh, snap beans, uh, those kind of things. Uh, potatoes, we have a time in August where we do the potatoes. Uh, we can also uh, plant summer squash uh, in August. I actually, you could, yeah, I think it's a little too early. You probably wait till about the 1st of August to go ahead and get that done. So lots of lots of different things to, to be taken care of out in the garden. You know, we we have this, it's interesting because we have a an incredibly long, incredibly hot season but we can garden 12 months out of the year. There's always something that can be grown 12 months out of the year here. But because of the summer that just shuts so many vegetables down and the winter when you occasionally get a freeze or the weather's too cool to grow vegetables, a species, period, uh, we end up with kind of several gardening seasons. The spring and the fall are the best gardening seasons there are. Winter's fine. Uh, but things move real slow as you go through winter. Like if you plant broccoli late, it's going to drag its feet before it finally produces heads if the weather's cold, really cold ongoing. Uh, and then in the summertime, there's it, things shut down, but you've got this fall and spring, and it's typically, I call them the traffic jams of the year. Because here we're going into fall, and I'm telling you, you can plant cucumbers, you can plant peppers, you can plant snap beans coming up here soon, uh, and the potatoes and squash and other things. And those are all growing in the garden, but it's time to plant broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and kohlrabi and eventually lettuce and spinach and carrots and beets and all those things. And so we sort of have a traffic jam in the garden, and you just have to decide, you know, what's the condition of the current plant? Is it probably not doing much, uh, so I'm going to pull it out, or is it doing well? I want to leave it for a little bit. That's just the decision. Something I think that you will benefit from is a chart I made on vegetable garden planting dates. And you can find this chart. We, we have put it online. It's on the Master Gardener website in here in Brazos County, Brazos County Master Gardener website. So if you go to brazosmg.com, brazosmg dot com slash edible dash gardening. If you just go to brazosmg.com, you can click your way through it. But if you add edible dash gardening, it gets you a little bit closer. And though you'll see there veggies and herbs, and you'll see some different things that are available. So it's, it's, it's well worth going to that website. There's a vegetable variety list for Brazos County, and the green chart I'm talking about is vegetable planting dates in Brazos County. It's a PDF. You can look at it on the computer. You can print it out and stick it on the refrigerator if you want. Uh, but it tells you all the different times to plant most of the kind of vegetables that we're going to grow here. You know, if it, we covered them all, it would be about 100 vegetables long. I don't know how many are on it, but not near that many. Uh, but that's a free resource that uh, you are welcome uh, to check out and take advantage of. Our phone number is 979-845-5689. 89, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. We'll talk about some of the ornamentals. Uh, right now, when I go out into the nurseries and garden centers, I was by the farm patch the other day and looking at some of the stuff they had. And you know, we got a lot of places around here that uh, that carry plants on through the year. And uh, one of the things that's that's around is uh, the um, 
uh, milkweed. And some places will have more than just the uh, Mexican or tropical milkweed. Uh, others, uh, some places will have some other varieties. But all of those are going to provide uh, nourishment for caterpillars, especially the monarch caterpillar specifically. Uh, as we get into fall, that's the time when we cut those all the way back to the ground so that we don't harbor some diseases that can affect the caterpillars as next year's growth comes out uh, as much. But that that's a wonderful one. Uh, I like uh, the butterfly vine, the Clytoria. I think it does really well uh, in warm weather and has a beautiful deep blue purple flowers that are often dried and used in making drinks. If you want to turn a drink blue, uh, you just steep some of those uh, flowers in it and it does really well kind of a cool thing uh, the salvias are always a good thing you know in the summertime uh, salvias just seem to soldier on and do really well there's our mealy blue sage uh, the augusta dualberg and the henry dualberg versions it's actually a kind of a hybrid but uh, they do well uh, there are uh, indigo spires, now that's kind of gone by the wayside, replaced by mystic spires. And uh, there's another one called misty, there are blue flowers. We have a fall blooming salvia or two in there too. Uh, the salvia lucentha, uh, autumn or Mexican, is that Mexican bush sage? I'm trying to think of the common name for it, it's escaping me at this moment. Uh, salvia lucantha just grows all year, it has a big clump that sends out silvery green leaves. And then it blooms, purple blooms. Uh, there's a purple, all purple form and a purple and white form that uh, do really well here. So now would be a good time to get one of those planted. You get a few blooms this year and then by next year have a real good strong plant and you could uh, have even better blooms as well. Gara's been looking pretty good through the spring. It's, it's kind of surviving the weather right now, uh, but it's another good one uh, that you can use. Uh, the shrimp plants in shady areas. The shrimp plant is a really good plant for areas that are bright shade. Uh, it's a beautiful little uh, flowers and it just does really well. And now in the full brunt of the sun, it's going to struggle along. But if you put a little bit of shade, uh, it'll do well. I just purchased some plumbago myself the other day. Uh, and uh, the imperial blue is one of the uh, cultivars that I really like. Uh, plumbago has kind of a sky blue, normally a sky blue flower or a white flower. It comes in two forms. And I used to think it was a wimp plant because, number one, it was blue. I don't know why I thought that, but I just it just didn't look like something to survive. And uh, one year we had a water line go out in an office where I worked and there were plumbagos planted outside and we went 60 days in summer without water. And oh boy, uh, a lot of things died. This plumbago looked bad, but it bounced back when it got water. It survived it, and it, that, it impressed me. You know, in the annuals, we got angelonias, a really good little summer flower, and of course the perennials like hibiscus. I, uh, I love uh, the tropical hibiscus, which just have the crazy multicolored blooms, and there's a series called, uh, let's see, what I think it's called the Cajun series, uh, it's, it is just really gorgeous colors. But we also have the standard southern uh, perennial hibiscus, rose mallow. And it, it has, uh, the, the standard hibiscus has giant flowers the size of a dinner plate that just look really good. That'd be another one uh, to consider uh, putting in uh, at this time. You know, and I, I just, I was talking about the salvias that there's been some breeding done and there's some new types that kind of have a fuchsia looking bloom. In fact, one of them is salvia rockin' fuchsia. That's its name, rockin' fuchsia. Uh, and another one is, uh, let's see, what's the other one called? Oh, it has, has blooms like that. But shop around, look for stuff. Uh, there's some really cool stuff out there that just survives and does well here. And so... I would recommend that. Another another salvia I like, by the way, uh, is, oh my gosh, it's salvia, gosh, I just went blank on the name. I'll find it in a minute. Uh, it has deep blue flowers, or even purple flowers. Uh, there's a sky blue version of it called Argentine Skies, and the name is Salvia Garanitica. There we go. Salvia Garanitica does uh, really well. It's uh, attractive to hummingbirds. They love those flowers to go in and get a drink. Uh, and so that's another reason uh, for growing a salvia like that one. 
Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U, gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Uh, we haven't had Jay from Texas Gardener on for a while, but we need to get him back up here because uh, I just, I love that magazine. If you, if you don't receive it, you, you really ought to consider it. It is a, is a really great source of Texas gardening information. Uh, it's the I think the term they use is written for Texas gardeners by Texas gardeners, and that uh, is a good way to put it. I know all the writers, almost all the writers on Texas Gardener, and they know what they're talking about. They, you know, they garden here, and then they write. They have the ability to write as well, and it just makes for good information. You know, we have our. Uh, coffee table magazines, you know, the fine gardening would be an example of something like that, uh, where it's just beautiful. You flip through it, you look at all the pictures, but don't do the things it says here in Texas. Uh, you know, it, it it's just different here. The plants that do well in some of those places are not going to do well here. Even the pot size, you'll see things planted in smaller containers. And here we need a bigger container because we need as much moist soil as possible to get those plants through so we're not watering two or three times a day trying to keep the thing alive. Uh, and speaking of watering, if you've never considered some ways to make your water system more efficient, that would be a good thing to do. Um, there's a, a website called BV Watersmart, as in Brazos Valley Watersmart.org. Here that uh, it, you can go on, you can sign up for announcements uh, and emails to tell you when it's time to water. You, there are a lot of different types of sprinklers or rotors out there, and they put out water at different rates. So when you sign up, you say, I've got this kind of a, a system, and uh, here's my address or my phone, uh, at least, uh, you know, the zip code area to get close enough. And they find a local weather station that now is measuring all the factors that make plants use water. So is it, um, how hot is it? What's the temperature? How humid is it? Uh, what is the solar radiation? You know, we think of the sun as just baking down every day, but different things in the sky, including clouds, of course, uh, affect how much solar radiation is coming down, and that affects how much water your plants use. I've got an article in, uh, let's see, what is this issue? This is the July-August issue uh, this month uh, and next, uh, called Efficient Lawn Watering. In fact, the whole the whole issue is based on, on watering. And I would encourage you to consider, maybe it means having a good irrigation company come in and change out the types of heads. There are heads that are efficient and there are heads that are very inefficient. Maybe it means adding a rain switch to your system. Have you ever driven down the road and watched sprinklers in somebody's yard while it's raining? Well, a rain switch, when it gets wet, it shuts it off and it doesn't let your system irrigate for a few days because you got rain. You don't need it. Uh, there are uh, ways that you can check the efficiency of how the system is putting out water. There's just a lot of good technology out there, and I would encourage you to do that. One of the things that I am just doing more and more in my landscape and is adding drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is not complex. It's not difficult to learn how to do it and to do a really good job with it. And uh, a little drip system uh, with a timer I've got mine on a hose-in timer. I probably need to hook it into the clock that waters the yard, but uh, it it is you can set it. Like let's say you wanted to drip your vegetables for an hour, which is a good amount of time because drip just puts out about a half a gallon an hour in many cases with each emitter. Uh, and you want to do that two days a week, and you want it on Wednesday, and you want it on, let's say, Saturday, and you want it to be done at 6 in the morning. You can buy a timer, you hook everything up to it, and it just takes care of it for you. And a lot less water is used. And here in the Bryan College Station area, we have a lot of, of sources that are high in sodium, uh, or high in bicarbonates, and for plants, that's not the best water. And so if we can cut down on how much we put out there and not put excessive amounts out there, the buildup of things we don't want to build up in the soil, like sodium, uh, can be significantly reduced. 
And so it just makes sense to water according to what the plant needs. Uh, yes, it's a higher water bill. Uh, yes, your sewer bill is often tied to your water bill. Uh, but uh, from the standpoint of, of the plants or uh, the economics and stuff and the standpoint of plant health, uh, it doesn't pay to overwater. And I just really, I know I'm a broken record kind of these last few shows talking about water, but it, it really is, is an issue. And so I would encourage you to think about what are some ways that I can make a more efficient system. I've got some, I've got a system that I had designed for, I need to add to it now, uh, for watering the containers on the patio. A little tube goes along there and it, you know, goes up and drops in each container and uh, just gives the exact right amount of water. The exact right amount of water. And as a result, when it comes on for the right amount of time, I don't have to worry about it. You know, I love containers, but I find myself, each year I say I'm not going to have that many containers again. And I find myself buying more plants and putting them in containers for the patio. And so if I have to go around and water each container day after day after day, that gets old. And it's really nice having an automatic system uh, that can do it for you. And it's so economical now to put in uh, an automatic drip system. Uh, I had a question that came in. Uh, someone has a shady area. It's a, it's a large area. And they don't know what to plant. And they want uh, something that's colorful. Well, a uh, few things to think about. Uh, number one, there is the potential sometimes for doing some tree trimming to improve the light in an area. Now, that doesn't mean you're cutting up all through the canopy uh, and then it grows together again and you're repruning all through the canopy. That's not a good that's not good for the trees. But lower hanging limbs, for example, to let some light in from the sides would help. Number two, what kind of tree is it? It doesn't say here, but if the tree is deciduous, uh, there may be some cool season color that, that would work in there. If the tree is, you know, like a live oak and basically leaves on all year, uh, then that's a little bit uh, of a different. Uh, the amount of shade, you know, they, we have all these different words we use for shade and none of us know what they mean. Like what's, what's the difference between part day sun and part day shade? Uh, well, <laughs> what part of the day or, or, or and so on. Uh, dappled shade can be really bright. And, and provide for flowering. A lot of the plants that have color are our flowering plants, and those need light uh, to do well. We have a few flowers for shade. Not a lot, but we have a few. Uh, if you looked at the shrimp plant I talked about before, uh, Hinkley's columbine, which is primarily a fall through winter and early spring plant, a Turk's cap can put up with some shade. A wishbone flower is called Taurinia. And, and then, of course, Impatience put up with quite a bit of shade. And all those bloom. They'll give you some nice blooms. Uh, there's even some gingers that do well in the shade. And if it's a really bright shade, Pentas will do real well there, too. And then in the shade, we look to color. And color is our friend. Color helps us get through the summer season because our number of blooming plants in summer the heat of summer compared to spring, uh, summer is just a fraction of the number of options that we have. And so when we go to foliage in the summertime out in the sun or foliage in the shade, uh, we can really do a good job. There is a, uh, a, a um, oh gosh, a plant called leopard plant. It's not really a color plant. It's ligularia. has big green, large leaves. It grows in the sun or in the quite a bit of shade, but the ones that are spotted, uh, which is where it gets the name leopard plant, those those will do well in a shade and, and just provide some interest and a little bit, a little bit of color there in the shady areas. Uh, white is the color too, and I like to use Aztec grass, which is, think of it more as a liriope or monkey grass. Uh, it's more, it's related to those, uh, but it has white and green striped leaves, mostly white, and uh, it really brightens up a shady area very well. Uh, if you've got a a shade and you need some some uh, foliage, the Japanese Aurelia. Uh, we also call that Fatsia, and uh, the uh, Acuba is another one that does well, makes a little shrub in those areas. Not super cold tolerant, but it's okay. It does pretty good uh, for you. And my favorite color plant for the shade is, is uh, Persian Shield. Uh, if it gets a decent amount of light, it really develops a beautiful purple color to the new growth. Uh, and in less light, it's going to be more of a kind of white and green look. Uh, but it's a silvery, I don't know if you can 
take green, white, silvery, and purple and put them all together. That's kind of what, what it amounts to. It's a really cool plant. So those are a whole bunch of ideas, but just some things that you can do uh, in the shade. That probably went way beyond what the person was asking from and standpoint of a question, but nevertheless, uh, I always like to expand some things because maybe you're listening and and you have the same kind of issue that the that the emailer or the caller had, uh, or maybe uh, you know you you just have wanted to understand why certain things happen. So we try to explain the why as well uh, as we go through this. Uh, let's see. I wanted had another. What was the uh, the last thing that I was going to talk about here? Oh, someone asked about uh, a ground cover uh, in sunny areas that uh, like Asian jasmine. Is there any other options? Well, first of all, there are options that are Asian jasmine that are different. There's one, and I'm not going to remember the names on these, but one that has yellow and bronze coloring in the leaves. There's one type that has white in the green. So as you you know, it's not just this dark green carpet. It is a beautiful color that uh, it adds to it. And that's a, I think that's a good way to go if you're looking for, you know, you like Asian jasmine, but you just want a little more color than the standard uh, types of Asian jasmine. Another thing to remember is sedge plants, sedges. Um, they are excellent in shady areas. There's a lot of types of sedge, Berkeley sedge and creek sedge and meadow sedge and a lot of others. But you clump them together just like you would liriope and they can form an entire carpet, about six, eight inches high uh, in the shady areas that you have. If it's a moderate amount of sun, they, they can take a little sun too. They just want to be on the full brunt of it. But that would be another option. There's even native sedges that you can use. Uh, if you if you want to cover an area, because you know just because we own property doesn't mean we need to cover every bit of it with grass. I know that's kind of the tradition, but uh, we have a lot of other plants, and in areas where grass doesn't thrive, we ought to put something that thrives. It just makes sense. Well, you've been listening to Garden Success, and I'm your host Skip Richter. We're here every Thursday from 12 to 1. Just want to remind you that you can listen to Garden Success by podcast. Also, check your podcast carrier. If you want to go to back shows, to go to the KAMU FM website and look for Garden Success, and you can check out some of the back shows, which you could also do by podcast. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.